Yep, it's me again. It's Dr. Shelley with HETV. And as you know, we're doing our GI today, but we're doing chronic GI. And don't worry, there's a whole series of acute GI, but today we're doing chronic GI. And I've already gone over glass, that's in another video. Glass told you where the organs were in the GI system, you know, like the gallbladder, liver, appendix, spleen, stomach, and sigmoid colon. Yeah, you better go watch that video. Here we are with the next part of this series, basics of digestion. The basics of digestion will keep you out of trouble. If everybody in America understood the basics of digestion, we wouldn't have the obesity, we wouldn't have the diabetes, we just wouldn't have a bunch of garbage like we have now. But they don't, and so here you are, and prayerfully you'll make a difference one patient at a time. So here's how we do it. We make sure that you understand that digestion starts from the ruta to the tuta, which means from your mouth to your behind, this is the entire digestive system. The problem with that is you have some concepts to remember. Now let me put some concepts on the board that you gotta remember. First of all, all GI is dirty. All GI is dirty. Now what does that mean? Well, it means that every single GI condition has the potential to cause your patient an infection or even sepsis and death because it's all dirty. How dirty, Shelly? Well, it's all dirty because you have something called E. coli. Now coli looks familiar because it's colon, right? Hello, that's exactly what it is. It is the normal flora of the GI system, but if it goes out of that system, it's going to cause some problems. So you gotta remember that I said all GI is dirty because it matters who you put in the room with this patient. You can't put an immunosuppressed patient in the room with the GI patient, because all GI is dirty. So your roommates matter and everything else. Now, when it comes to all GI being dirty, that's cute, but not if you don't know the GI body parts. Like if you don't know that liver is GI and that appendix is GI and that your, your pancreas is GI and well then it doesn't matter because you're going to see pancreatitis and not clue in that all GI is dirty. Now we're doing chronic GI, but let me just say this little trick for you, this little rhyme that you always know I come up with when it comes to acute GI and a little bit of even the chronic GI conditions. Here it is. Every emergency that comes in the emergency room with a GI issue, we pretty much know how it's going to go. So here we go. I, V, N, G, Fo, Li, Surgery. The next part of it, we continue on, is antibiotics and lights. Now, watch this. IVNG Foley surgery, antibiotics, and lights. What does that mean? That means every single GI patient better have two IVs, one in each arm. Every single GI patient coming in the door may be a candidate for an NG if they are severe in their presentation. And if it's not going to be the NG, remember the N for NPO. When it comes to the Foley, so many GI emergencies require surgery. And when you're doing surgery in the GI department, the bladder can get in the way. So we need to keep it empty. And many of those patients may need a Foley. When it comes to surgery, there's so much that needs to be surgically repaired, surgically resected, you know, a bowel resection, uh, um, an ileostomy, uh, whatever it is. Uh, if, if you got diverticulitis and you ruptured something, ruptured diverticulum, ruptured appendix, ruptured this and ruptured that, it's all gonna be surgery. Okay, now, one of the things for surgery just because it makes the rhyme even more fun. E, G, D, or colonoscopy. I'm going to say that.
that again. So IVNG Foley Surgery EGD. I, I could go on and on. This is fun. EGD Esophageal Gastro Duodenoscopy. That you already know because I taught you what gastro was in the last video. It's your esophagus, your stomach, and your duodenum. Your duodenum is a small intestine. That looks at the upper GI system and tells me why it's acting crazy. The colonoscopy is your, 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 your bottom part, right? The tuna. This is going to look at your colon. It said colonoscopy. Hello, come on, stay with me. So it's going to look at your colon and lower, you know, GI tract, if you will, rectum, anus, the whole bit. For some patients, they need both. We're going to talk about that. So if you're smart, you already know what's going on with the second part. The second part said antibiotics. I just told you all GI is dirty. So you already know this patient's going to get some antibiotics because what we don't need is for that E. coli in the GI system to go in the GU system. Oh, you forgot what GU was. Genital urinary. You know your bladder is sterile. And here you are with this old nasty E. coli and having problems with some kind of GI problem, if that E. coli enters that sterile bladder, we're gonna have some problems, okay? All right, and then you have your electrolytes. Now, once again, this is common sense. When you're losing fluid, or you're throwing up, or you have diarrhea, or you're bleeding, of course your electrolytes are gonna take a hit. And what does GI mean if not N, V, and D? Oh, I'm sorry, I'll be talking about like abbreviations all the time, but here we go. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Going forward, I ain't gonna keep breaking stuff down for you. It's gonna be an N, V, and a D. Y'all got me? Okay, stay with me, I got more for you. So right there, we know IV, NG, Foley, surgery, EGD, colonoscopy, antibiotics, and lights might be part of any test answer. I mean, we are preparing you for NCLEX, okay? Moving on for digestion. You might want to do what I call take good notes, and I call this a chain gang. A chain gang means that you write stuff down and then you write an arrow between it. Let me give you an example. You put the food in your mouth, right? And you masturbate it. <gasps> My bad, I do this every time. I don't know what it is, I think I need Jesus. I mean masticate it, okay? That just means chew it up, baby. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So we're gonna say teeth cause you to masticate the food. Okay, so you getting a general idea of what I'm doing now, cause I'm finna talk about it and I'm gonna be writing it. You gonna be writing it. I'm about to tell you the entire digestive system from the ruta to the tuta. So here we go. Yo crazy behind went to McDonald's. There's prayers for you at this point. You probably didn't see my other videos, but you know, you went to McDonald's. You got a burger, you got a fries, you got a uh, order of fries. You supersize your shake. And because a shake doesn't quite quench your thirst, your crazy behind got a pop. And then you got real ghetto fabulous with it. You got one of them pies. And then you uh, you thought it might be a good idea to go ahead and get a Danish for later. Hmm. Okay, so we're going to work with all that food right now. You put that burger in your mouth. The minute you put that burger in your mouth and your 32 teeth started chewing it, you had something called amylase released from your salivary glands. It originally came from your pancreas, but it matters that you know that, 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 um, that enzyme, amylase, sound like a girl's name. Now, if you're smart, you remember from school, anything ending in ASE was an enzyme. So that amylase, or that enzyme has a purpose. It was to digest any of the complex carbs that you ate. Now, well, we have to reflect back. What did you eat? You had a burger, you had fries, you had that stupid shake, and then you had that pop, you had a Danish and a pie, and you just got stupid with it. But when we look at all that hot mess that you ordered, 
It was the fries that were the complex carb. Don't get it twisted. Carbs break down into sugar, and yes, that pop was a sugar, and yes, that shake was a sugar, but it sure as hell wasn't complex. It was simple. Everybody know it was sugar. Complex carbs like fries and pasta and rice and bread and soft pretzels and crackers and those sorts of things those and potatoes right fries so those sorts of things are complex carbs and you need amylase to break that down in the body so that's what's going on in your body okay you got the you bit the sandwich it masticated with the 32 teeth you got we went on ahead and secreted some amylase through the salivary glands to help us digest that complex carb and then once we got it soft and moist and to a point where we could swallow it it was called a bolus of food you took that bolus of food and if all goes well you sent it down your throat which is your pharynx to your esophagus and there's an upper esophageal uh, segment and that's supposed to take the food and move it on down and then there's a lower esophageal segment that stops somewhere around this diaphragm if the lower esophageal segment of your esophagus is working well when you swallow the food it will close off once it hits the esophagus once the esophagus pushes it down into the stomach it'll close off real nice and tight so you don't get no reflux the only problem with that is most of america has reflux well why shelly why are you talking like that why is everybody got reflux why is everybody buying protonics why is everybody buying prolisec why is everybody buying nexium why is everybody in sam's club and costco and getting a big box and all these ppis that people take it why Oh, I got you. It's because two thirds of America is obese. And when you're obese, your belly puts pressure on your contents inside your belly, including your stomach, and pushes that esophagus, pushes against that lower esophageal, esophageal segment, weakens it over time, and then food and stuff just come right back up because it don't close tightly after you went ahead and sent it to the stomach. That's just real. Now, don't be mad at yourself if you're pregnant because you can't help it it ain't you honey it's your baby pushing up against your esophagus and that's your heart burner we get that so you know there's other reasons but let's just talk shop because this is america with these people that's kind of like fluffy okay so here we go i hope y'all stay with me we at the point where the bolus went down the esophagus and when the bolus goes down the esophagus it needs to make a what a left hand turn what do we call that beyonce uh, no, no, not quite. To the left, to the left, sort of Beyonce, but to the left, to the left is the stomach, okay? So stay with me. Focus. Now, we're all up in the stomach. The stomach. What's going on in the stomach? Well, hell, let's see. In the stomach is something called hydrochloric acid. Mm. Hydrochloric acid acid oh god but that's okay because in this case that bolus that you sent down your esophagus and it made a left hand turn in the stomach it's the stomach's job to mix it fix it churn it and burn it and hopefully make it a nice more liquidy mass of food that you can send on to the you know small intestine this takes four hours if you eat something fattening, it takes longer, which is not a bad thing because we in America have been made to believe that fat was bad. It's all BS. I eat two packs of bacon every day. So if we eat something fattening, it takes longer to digest, which in my situation, working as hard as I do, that means I don't have to worry about eating again for a while because I'm full. If you eat a carb, you know that fries that you just put in your mouth you know that pop you know that shake you know the pie the danish if you eat those things they're gonna digest super fast you'll be hungry again trust me you'll be looking for burger king next because you're an equal opportunity employer so when you eat carbs digest fast when you eat fat takes its time here's something else that takes its time fiber if anything you eat has fiber in it it's going to keep you full longer that's important you shouldn't be eating every two hours i don't know if anybody ever told you 
okay because you don't give your body a chance to rest and recuperate all right so here we go we got our stomach we got our hydrochloric acid now there are five nutrients yes you hear me five five nutrients that are absorbed in the stomach you didn't hear this in school you heard that the small intestine did all the absorption not quite true let's see what they are those five nutrients that are absorbed by the stomach include vitamin D, calcium, those are two, they go together, you can look at it in tail. Then we have our vitamin B12, and we have our iron, and then we have magnesium. Now, why do you care? Oh, you care. You know why you care? Because if you take PPIs, Prilosec, Nexium, Protonics, and all the rest of the meds that are supposed to decrease your hydrochloric acid and treat your little heartburn and fix your little reflux and hook your GERD up and all this other mess you got going on, and you're taking it more than two weeks, which is what the package says you're supposed to do. If you take these meds long term, then help me understand without hydrochloric acid how you absorb vitamin D, calcium, B12, iron, and magnesium. Because you see, if you have common sense, you know that you're not absorbing those five nutrients so that the patient that is taking that PPI, you know, Prilosec, Nexium, and, and Protonics, and all this hot mess, the person taking those meds for a long time are going to have brittle bones. Don't think that's a great idea when you could have just lost weight and got rid of GERD all by yourself. Now, be careful. If you have had an ulcer, if you have ever had a GI bleed, if you are small framed, not obese at all, I ain't even talking to you because you might have to be on these meds for the rest of your life. That is to protect you. You don't want to stop that. This is why I say you got to talk to your doctor about anything we talk about because I'm giving you facts, but those facts have to be modified for you because everybody's different. Me, myself, and I, there's no way in hell I'm taking a PPI. I don't need it. Didn't have an ulcer, didn't have a GI bleed, don't want to mess up my bones, I'm good, okay? Now, after we did the stomach, gotta get out the stomach, we sat in that mug for four hours. The stomach has something at the bottom of it called a pyloric sphincter. It's like a little bit of a muscular contraction that slowly, methodically, and gently takes the food from the stomach and pushes it into the duodenum or the small intestine. Now don't act brand new. You knew there was three parts of your small intestine. There was the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. Well, we at the top. So this is the duodenum. This sphincter, this pyloric sphincter, if you didn't have it, and you had food in the stomach that needed to go to the small intestine, if you did not have that pyloric sphincter, that would be called dumping syndrome. Your food would literally dump into your small intestine and you would be feeling some kind of way. We're gonna be talking about that. So for right now, you know that this is called a pyloric sphincter that is a very necessary part of your stomach, but because some patients do have weight loss surgery, we do cut away that part of the stomach. And unfortunately for those patients, they may have a little bit of dumping syndrome as they transition through without that pyloric sphincter. But if you never had weight loss surgery and instead you just had a pyloric sphincter and you're going through digestion of your McDonald's garbage, then it's going to deliver that burger, those fries, that shake, that pop, that pop that Danish into your duodenum slowly but surely. Now once it hits the duodenum, you know the top of the small intestine, it's going to trigger several things to happen because the small intestine, and I hope you're writing this down because you're sitting there looking at me all crazy and she ain't wrote nothing yet. I need you to write. The small intestine, the liver, the pancreas, and the gallbladder all four organs share something called a common bile duct. So when the foods in the small intestine 
it's going to get the team in order. It's going to trigger the gallbladder. You remember the gallbladder, right upper quadrant in the back? in the hood the gallbladder is going to release something called bile now you can't be goofy don't act brand new go back to anatomy no the gallbladder didn't produce the bile it just secreted the bile remember how this goes the message comes up from the duodenum hey we got food up in here this fool ate this fatty burger and the gallbladder say i got you and it contracts and releases bile to emulsify, rip up, tear down, melt the fat so you can absorb it later. Now, the liver actually produced the bile, but him and the gallbladder are cool. So once the liver produced the bile, the liver got such an important job. It's got so many things it has to do. It ain't got time to be holding on to no dang old bile. Plus it's a heavy substance, it burns. It's a, hey, 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 gallbladder, look, go ahead and store this for me for when this food eats some fatty foods and then you can go ahead and secrete, take care of that business because I, I, I ain't got time. It's, it's below my pay grade. Okay, so the liver and the gallbladder have an understanding. The liver produces the bile, the gallbladder secretes the bile, the small intestine sent the message that we need the bile. Now, the pancreas, I told you, was in part of that little hood group too, you know, the gang. And so the pancreas is the coldest one of all. You could say that the pancreas was the mafia. You could say that because the pancreas is going to control everything. And when it don't go right in the pancreas, then all those other organs, they get jacked up. So here comes the pancreas. The pancreas has a big job. It produces insulin. Mm. Insulin is going to do what? Y'all don't remember? Okay, let me remind you. Insulin is going to take all that sugar. Oh, psh, let me play the tape back. It's going to take the fries, which was a sugar. It's going to take that shake, which is a sugar. It's going to take that pop which is a sugar, it's going to take that Danish and that pie, which is a sugar, and it's going to do three things with it. You ate so much, it's really going to do three things with it. First, the insulin is going to open up your muscles, let some of the sugar get in those cells in your muscles. And that's a good thing because you got to keep it moving. You know we do. We just be moving. We've got things to do. We can't sit down. That's cool. You might even feel a little energy after that happens. Then you ate so much sugar, it's going to send some of that sugar to the liver. And then the liver is going to store it for when you're crazy behind go to sleep tonight. Prayerfully, you get a good night's sleep. Because see, when you work night shift and you don't get a good night's sleep and your day sleep is all jacked up, you never empty out the liver. And not emptying out the liver means that the liver becomes overflowing with sugar called glycogen and there's no more room. And while it's sitting there overflowing in the liver, it creates something called fatty liver disease. And so you don't want that. But it, you know, if it happens, it happens. And so we have a third place though. I told you there was three places for the sugar. The third place, are you ready for this? Because it has unlimited storage ability. Sort of like the deep freezer in your basement. The liver was like your refrigerator. The muscles was like the table that you had the dinner on in the first place. You ate the dinner on the table the food was immediately used and you washed off the table, put the dishes in the dishwasher, kept it moving. But if you had so much dinner on the table, you know, like your pie, your Danish, your pop, your shake, if you had so much dinner on the table, you had to put them leftovers in the refrigerator. Now, that was your liver. That's where the leftovers went. But the nice thing about leftovers is it tastes better the second day. So you went in the refrigerator tomorrow and got the food out, heated it up, ate it up, cool modi. Your liver did the same thing. Tonight, while you sleep, it opened up, it sent that glycogen to literally keep all your organs moving and flowing and your heart beating and your, your peristalsis and your GI system and your kidneys making urine and, and all the things we do while we're sleeping. That's fantastic. That was the refrigerator, remember? That was the liver but the deep freezer. Down in the basement or in the garage. This is huge. How much food can it store, Shelly? Oh, enough for a whole winter's night. I mean, you know, the whole winter. You remember little books you used to read, whole winter's night? No, the whole winter season, you can put food in the deep freezer. That's how some of y'all stomach look. 
like you've been storing for the whole winter season. Why does it have to be that way? Well, we know that back in the day there were times of starvation. And so back in those days, not these days, back in those days, your body is so fantastic. And because God made no mistakes, he created you so amazing that you could go days without eating because you had storage here and you had storage here. Yo behind don't need no storage here. So what happens to you? Cause you keep eating, never ever starving. Your belly just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. I'll never forget it. My kid asked my dad, Papa, are you having a girl or a boy? What? What kind of shit is that? Think about it. Your belly has unlimited storage ability. So the fact that your pancreas makes insulin and the whole purpose of insulin is to get sugar in the body for energy and in the liver for storage tonight and in the belly for point times of starvation. This is gonna be a problem as you look throughout America and you look at people and you think, oh God, they have enough storage for two years, exactly. All right, so you're staying with me because so far those organs, and I hope you paid attention, pancreas, gallbladder, and liver they were three and they were there right there with the common bile duct they shared the same common bile duct and the small intestine was at the end of it and these three are called accessory organs because they play a role in secondary digestion it's kind of cold-blooded how that all worked out now stay with your girl your pancreas i told you was gangster i told you mafia and so your your pancreas your pancreas makes two more things and then we're going to give you a break because I know you got a lot to think about after I got done with all this mess. Your pancreas is going to produce something called lipase. What is lipase? An enzyme to digest fat. I'll be back. It's all about the fat. <laughs>